Um, so I'm Julia Resnick. I am a Senior Program Manager for Strategic Initiatives at the AHA. Um, I will be your moderator for this session. So we've all experienced how COVID-19 has challenged us to use technology in different ways. Um, and leveraging those technologies has been key for our healthcare organizations to ensure that they can continue to provide care for our patients and for our communities. Um, and this is certainly the case in the maternal health space. Um, and it, these innovative startup companies are developing solutions that are helping um, improve how healthcare systems deliver care to mothers and their babies. Um, and we're really lucky to have a few of them with us today for a conversation about how technology can drive better maternal health outcomes. Um, and I am so pleased to introduce our panel. Um, so we have Melissa Hanna, the co-founder and CEO of Mommy, which is a comprehensive prenatal and postpartum care coordination platform that increases positive health outcomes for moms and babies. So Melissa, since COVID-19 hit, how has Mommy modified its telehealth services to better address the needs of patients? Um, and can you talk a bit about how Mommy has made adjustments for clinical workflows um, in triaging prenatal and postpartum concerns? Hi, everyone. Um, as, uh, as Julia shared, Mommy is a um, maternal and infant telehealth and care coordination platform. We partner with hospitals and health systems and integrated delivery networks around the country to connect patients and providers together uh, throughout their uh, pregnancy, uh, labor and delivery, and postpartum experience up until baby's first birthday. So connectivity across the continuum of care is um, the ultimate goal for, uh, for our work and uh, the mission is equitable access to comprehensive care for moms and babies. Uh, during the pandemic, we've seen um, a real spike in um, activity across the company um, in, in patients and providers finding uh, new value in use, using the platform um, and in new and creative ways. Uh, the kinds of changes that we've had to make um, in order to accommodate the needs of patients and providers in um, all different types of communities across the United States, uh, I would say fall into three primary buckets, technical, operational, and clinical. Technical challenges and, uh, and solutions in that, in that category would include things like accommodating changes in bandwidth, um, folks that are needing to go online in environments that are different than where they might have previously accessed um, the internet, uh, where you might have otherwise um, emailed in a question to your doctor from your desk at work, where you may have really fast um, internet speeds at your office. Uh, you're now working from home and doing everything else from home, including your prenatal visits. And so creating technical fail-safes that allow for a video call to persist, even if bandwidth is changing, um, uh, to accommodate multi, uh, many different types of devices, um, and, uh, uh, uh different, um, different technologies, uh, generally, um, is, is one way to think about the kinds of accommodations that, that, um, we're making now and, and finding ways to sustain over time and beyond the, uh, pandemic. Um, translation services is a big change, something that, uh, was on our roadmap. Um, prior to the pandemic and very quickly became a top need um, as we partnered with health systems that had um, a substantial uh, portions of their population uh, immediately needing translation services during video call visits, something that um, wasn't really addressed at the beginning. Everyone said immediately, oh, we need video calling, but then, well, what do we do when we would have normally had a patient um, whose primary language is not English come in for an in-clinic appointment and um, and you'd normally maybe bring in a translator into the into the clinic visit room uh, to be there, or you would call them and have on speakerphone someone um, to translate. Now you're in a video call. How do you integrate that experience? So we immediately um, began developing a feature to allow for that. Um, some of the other uh, some of the other things are operational and clinical in that um, we started to invest very heavily in expanding the content library around evidence based material that would have otherwise been handed physically to um, a patient during a prenatal visit, during an ultrasound, um, during a postpartum um, visit, either at the OB or, or at the pediatric appointment. And so, partnering with organizations like uh, the Proclamsha Foundation. Um, Count the kicks on field movement monitoring um, with a number of national nonprofits around um, breastfeeding support, mental health, nutrition and wellness, um, and prenatal education has really amped up our resources in that way. And then um, also partnering with folks 
in each community to be able to expand the referral networks available through the platform is something that we've uh, invested in from the clinical side. Because if you, for example, um, as, as I think a lot of technology companies are seeing in women's health right now, if you're seeing a lot of high screenings around anxiety and depression um, in your platform, you need to be able to then take action on that. You can't just say, hey, you screened really high for this. You should do something about this. Um, it, it's the, the responsible clinical measure is to then facilitate that referral and, and um, ensure that uh, your user, your patient is getting access to care. So really dialing that up has been a big part of our work. And then finally, expanding our own staff. We staff with nurses that are VRNs, virtual nurses that are facilitating care and coordination across that entire continuum. So we touch the patient's lives at many points in time and interact with their providers accordingly. So really being able to, um, to su support a growing population meant literally in expanding our, our own support team internally, not just the technology and the outside partnerships that we have. So I'll, I'll pause there. There's so many moving parts to it, but that's what I think is a, a glimpse into the rapidly changing landscape of healthcare uh, technology companies um, like ours. Um, we also have Allie Hallman. Uh, she's a social worker and the manager of patient care and customer success at Baby Scripts a virtual maternity care company that gives women access to education, remote monitoring, and a direct connection to their OB care team through a mobile app and remote monitoring devices. Um, so we all know that technology can be challenging, especially um, for people living in rural communities. So how is Baby Scripts using its resources to reach racially diverse and rural communities? Hi, thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talking to you all. Um, I, I just first want to address, you know, everything that's been talked about today. We've talked a lot about the racial disparity that exists in our country, um, and this is a subject we just can't uh, ignore or leave behind. Um, and I think uh, part of what's so important really in this topic is to address uh, the maternal and maternity care deserts that um, are really uh, critical uh, in addressing the maternal health disparity that exists in our country. Um, and, and I think, you know, we don't use the term maternity care desert uh, often, so um, just to, to really clarify what I'm talking about here, um, there are 7 million birthing people in the United States that live in an area with limited or no access to maternity care. Um, we heard a bunch of statistics earlier, um, uh, statistics around uh, how people in both rural and in urban areas don't have access to care. In my hometown of DC, um, about half of the birthing population lives in a quadrant of the city where there's no place to deliver a baby. Um, and that is just, uh, you know, a staggering statistic. So it's just important to know that um, rural communities are uh, important to address, but these maternity care deserts also exist in urban areas as well. Um, at Baby Scripts, what we're doing is using technology to really improve access to care for all birthing people um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is through education. The second is through a provider connection um, and remote patient monitoring. And then lastly, we're partnering with payers, um, mostly Medicaid MCOs in the community, to uh, really uh, enhance coordination of care. So I'm just going to talk through each of those topics pretty quickly. Um, in terms of education, we've partnered with uh, a federally qualified health center in the DC area um, and others across the country to make sure that not only is our education, you know, there to empower women and make sure that they understand, um, you know, what's going on in their body and with their baby as their pregnancy progresses, um, but also that the content that we provide is um, culturally competent and sensitive. Um, we want to make sure that it's at a reading level that people understand that not only is it just words, but that the, it's accessible for everyone, that there are videos in there um, that, you know, people who uh, are at a low reading level can watch instead of read. So um, things like that that are just really important um, as we, you know, move forward in addressing the maternal health disparity um, to really 
educate women first. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing um, that I want to talk about is our remote monitoring program that we offer. So um, we offer a blood pressure monitoring program that allows for um, uh, women to birthing people to take their blood pressures from wherever they are um, and always know that they're being watched by their provider. Um, what we really want to do is allow for prenatal care to take place um, anywhere at any time. Um, we don't want you know the the care only to be delivered in the uh, provider office, but for that experience to extend out and knowing that the patient and uh, the birthing parent is connected to their provider at all times. Um, and lastly, you know, what I'm really excited the most about to talk with you guys about today, um, because I'm a social worker and because I believe so uh, strongly in the coordination of care, um, is that We've partnered with uh, Medicaid MCOs to bring our app experience to over 1,000 birthing people with Medicaid um, and given them access to a risk assessment where they can identify risks that are immediately reported back to their care team, which is comprised of the provider team and the payer team, um, but they're also immediately connected to local resources. And this is important because, um, as we all know, collaboration of care is just critical in the outcome of a patient. The more people who are um, on the same page about the care, the better. Um, and then secondly, just we want to always empower parents as they're going through the pregnancy experience to um, advocate for themselves. And the best way to do that is to give them access to resources and education. Um, and so we really you know, want to make sure that um, we're providing care um, across a, a continuum and not just in the provider office or um, asking the parent to read a pamphlet when they go home. Um, so again, thank you for having me today. I'm really excited about this and, and excited to hear from Crystal also. And last but not least, we have Crystal Evolocha, uh, CEO and co-founder of Cura Health, which is dedicated to increasing access and health resources for young women. Crystal has a passion for women's health, health equity and creating safe spaces for young women to seek professional medical advice. So, Crystal, we know that Kira, connects, Kira Health connects young women in colleges and universities to various clinicians and experts. Can you share how you do that and how you plan on advancing your efforts? Absolutely. Um, thanks again for having me. My name is Crystal Veloce. Um, I am CEO of Kira Health. Uh, our mission at CARA, just to reiterate, is to increase access to health resources for young people uh, so that they can, you know, seek professional medical advice in a safe, uh, comfortable space. Uh, what we've done um, is we've provided a platform where essentially a young person can connect with an expert, um, including OBGYNs, nurse practitioners, uh, certified nurse midwives, uh, therapists, including uh, psychiatrists and more, and it's available via phone, video, and chat. And what we've done most recently in this COVID era is we created Kira, um, and Kira itself is an AI care coordinator that helps young people kind of determine the type of clinician to connect with because we kind of found out a lot of young people just didn't know what an OBGYN was, what a certified nurse midwife was, but or just never had the experience of seeking that type of care. So Kira asks the questions, does not provide any medical advice, but simply just lets them know who to talk to, connects them, creates the appointments, uh, follow-ups and things like that, kind of, you know, automating that process of the care coordination uh, so that folks don't have to, um, and the, you know, young people feel safe about it. So what we've done is we started to partner with colleges and universities uh, to act as, you know, an extension of the health center that they have pre-existing for like a larger institution uh, in tandem with their university health center or for a smaller institution, uh, you know, some that don't typically have like an existing health center uh, to be their women's health arm. And a lot of what we've been trying to do in convincing, uh, you know, schools is the core importance of 
women's health in college. Um, I started this company because I had a very scary health experience where I Googled all my symptoms. Um, I passed out one day and I was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery in a very unrelated condition from what I found on the internet. And you find a lot of young people, you know, spend a lot of time on the internet searching their issues because they're either uncomfortable, they don't have access, or they've just never sought that kind of care and they're now independent young adults in college and they're seeking care. So we're coming in to kind of bridge that gap and prepare them so that they're proactively seeking care. And some of the conversations that we've had all day today have been around, you know, providing proactive versus reactive ways of, you know, solving this maternal health issue. Um, and what we've tried to do essentially is, you know, take them through that journey because, as you know, in women's health, there's different phases of a woman's life. Um, and I also do not like the preconception term because it just signals you have to be preparing yourself to have a baby. Uh, for us, what's important is making sure that young people do not have underlying health issues um, when they get to a point where they need a mommy or they need a baby script. So getting them fully prepared to get to that stage so that they have less health issues and better health outcomes. So. So we don't have that much time left. I wish I had an extra 20 minutes to talk with you all. But I think for the last question, we're just going to do a quick lightning round um, to leave on a, a bright note. So we know that COVID-19 has been a really stressful time for everyone, and everyone has had to make modifications and adapt. Um, but what have, what have you been learning during this pandemic, and are there any bright spots that you could share? Uh, Allie, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so I, I think the biggest takeaway that I've seen in COVID is just that uh, the medical field is more adaptable than they let on. Um, I think, you know, this has forced a lot of uh, providers and health systems to make very rapid changes, um, and they've done that. And, uh, and I think that it's going to impact everything moving forward in how we approach pregnancy care and how we approach um, maternal health care. So I'm really excited about that, and I, I uh, think it, it gives us leverage to keep pushing for more changes. Uh, Crystal, how about you? Yeah, kind of similar to Ali's point, a lot of what we've seen is, you know, the fast adaption of telemedicine and, you know, the highlighting of the importance. Um, what we've also seen on the university side, or college side of things, a lot of folks are seeking ways to increase access for their students, specifically with the fact that they're struggling to determine whether or not students are going to be on campus, off campus, or have like a, you know, um, hybrid type of situation, right? So what we're seeing is, you know, the importance of thinking about things like outbreak tracing and contact tracing and things like that to be able to easily, safely transition folks back to school. And I think that cuts across everywhere, even the transition back, back to work and, you know, life as usual. But what um, I'm really seeing is a huge adoption, even from the payer side with, like, the student health insurance plans that cover these things being more receptive of products like ours. Um, and that's super exciting. And we're just looking forward to doing some more work. Yeah. Well, I'd say that um, other bright spots that uh, we're seeing um, are on the um, on the patient side. In that there is, as we as we all have known, there is such a need for uh, for additional um, support and attention to be paid to mothers um, and to new and expecting families generally, and the enthusiasm for um, for these services and for these platforms um, in the community is uh, is incredibly high. Um, and it is uh, absolutely creating uh, the forcing function that um, I think that we all uh, in, knew and, and, and believe would um, would occur at some point, um, but certainly did not want to have happen under these circumstances. So we're seeing uh, these sort of double effects here of um, the realization that digital health is an essential tool in the provider's toolkit. Um, which is driving that adoption, as Ali has, has mentioned, on the provider side, but that also the um, availability is 
uh, having that effect of creating this feedback loop where patients are saying, yes, absolutely, I've wanted this, I've needed this, I thought you had this already, you know, can I, uh, can I communicate this way with you? And, and it's not just about video calling between patients and providers. The other exciting thing that we're seeing is that, um, our platform, uh, for example, our group video calling functionality is being used, uh, by providers, uh, to communicate with each other, to be able to be in consult, to be able to perform, um, grand rounds. Um, we're seeing virtual trainings, um, happen through the platform where providers are teaching each other how to use telehealth tools and communication technology to stay in touch uh, with their with their patients. So all of these are very promising signs, uh, despite the circumstances under which they're happening. Thank you so much, Ali, Crystal, and Melissa, for sharing your expertise and your insights and teaching us more about uh, what your companies do. And we look forward to hearing how things continue to change and grow um, as we move forward. So thank you, thank you, thank you.